welcome and happy Valentine's Day. We're glad to see you all here today for the second in the series of speakers of our spring session. Very excited to have Tony Kading joining us today. There's brochures about what she's speaking about, Patients' Choice of Vermont, on the table. You can grab some on the way out. And there's also some Valentine chocolates left. So uh, I'm going to introduce Tony. She has a brief set of slides that she's going to share with us. And she's leaving a lot of time for discussion and questions. And she will answer them as she's going along with her presentation. If you've got a question, you're afraid you're going to forget it. Just put up your hand, and she will recognize you. Um, I first met Tony in 1977, and uh, so we go way back. I was just started up the Horn of the Moon Cafe, and she was running an apartment right behind it. She and her husband, John, had just moved to Vermont. We've been lucky to have them as Vermonters all these times, joining, joining us in our lives and helping us through many medical challenges. <laughs> so Tony uh, is a longtime nurse who has worked in clinical, academic, administrative, and policy positions in Vermont. She retired from the University of Vermont where she held both faculty and administrative appointments in the College of Nursing and Health Sciences and as director of the Freeman Scholars Program. She co-chairs Patients' Choice of Vermont Board and handles many calls from patients and providers that Patients' Choice of Vermont receives. She lives at the end of a dirt road with her family in Worcester, Vermont. Let's give her a welcome and start her up. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming in today. Um, I see some familiar faces in the audience, and that's nice. So um, my name is Tony Kading, and as Ginny said, I'm a nurse. My clinical background, which I think might be relevant here, is oncology, because oncology comes up a lot around medical aid and dying. Um, I'm retired, and I volunteer for Patient Choices Vermont, which is a not-for-profit organization. There's information about it in there. But it's an organization that uh, is made almost completely of volunteers, doctors, nurses, pharmacists, social workers, and others. Um, and it was the organization that ushered medical aid and dying into law in Vermont 10 years ago, in 2013. And since that time, it's been um, around only for education and safeguarding the law and um, trying to assist access. So um, I kind of like to keep this informal, so I will leave time at the end, but if you have comments or questions, please interrupt me and, um, and, um, and, and I'd like to handle it that way. Um, and if you have any experience with medical aid and dying, either direct or indirect, please, please chime in because to a large degree, what I ta will talk about is the way the law is supposed to work, and I would like to know if that's not the way it always does work. So um, please, uh, let's make this a conversation. If you have anything to add, I'd love to hear it and just chime in. OK, push the button. Oh, now there's a whole bunch of them. That's the one. There we go. Okay. So let's start with the definition. The definition of medical aid in dying is medical aid in dying gives adults who are terminally ill and who are capable of making their own decisions the option to receive a prescription medication to be self-administered to bring about a peaceful death at the time of the patient's choosing. The four highlighted words there are key because that's what defines eligibility. We often get you know, calls that say, how do I apply? Well, you don't actually apply. You have to be eligible, and your doctor makes that decision. 
And these are basically the terms upon which the, your doctor decides whether you're eligible or not. Adult means uh, 18 years or older. Um, terminally ill means within the last six months of your life. Capable means mentally competent, and self-administered means that you must be able to, um, to, to most often uh, drink a small portion of liquid that the, contains the medication. Okay, what I'd like to talk about today is what, medica what medical aid in dying is and what it's not. So I'm gonna start with what it's not because that's simpler and shorter. So, Ginny. Medical aid in dying is not three things. First of all, it's not suicide, it's not euthanasia, and it's not for everyone. So why isn't it suicide? Because it kind of sounds like suicide. You take a drink of something that has, you know, a fatal potion in it, you drink it, and, and your life has ended. It's not suicide for three reasons. First is a legal reason. What is, what is put on the um, death certificate is the underlying pathology. For example, if you come to medical aid and dying because you have pancreatic cancer and you already are dying of pancreatic cancer and you're in the last six months of your life, that's what comes on to the death certificate, pancreatic cancer. The second reason um, is that, that, it, that it's, there's a legal difference, is that insurance can't be denied if you use medical aid in dying. And that's not always true for, uh, for suicide, but often suicide victims, the families, are denied um, the benefits. So right in the actual Act 39 um, law, it says, it uses the, um, the term, shall not be denied insurance benefits. So yeah, question. Including Medicare? Medicare doesn't work for medical aid and dying because it's um, federal. And this is being approved as a state by state thing. We can talk a little bit more about that later because it's not that people who choose medical aid in dying can't receive Medicare benefits. They absolutely can. The, me the benefits just can't be paying for things directly related to the um, act of medical aid in dying. Such it's, as the medication? Such as the medication. Yeah? I'm looking at the legal difference, and it's, it's, it occurs to me that you're losing it in a death certificate if it says pancreatic cancer. Are, are we losing the historical fact that the person made this choice in his life, which is an important choice? Yes, you are losing that information on the death certificate. I, I notice that more and more people are including it in their obituary um, or telling the story. Um, and I think are moved to tell the story in most cases because it's a positive experience. But, um, but it doesn't show up on the death certificate. Yeah? So that means we, we can't collect the data for Vermont, or is there another way to collect the data? On oh, no, there's lots of data. Okay. They, the law um, asks the Department of Health to actually collect the data around this and they report out to the public every two years. And I'll talk about some of those numbers in a few minutes. Um, OK, so um, there's a legal difference. There's also a practical difference, I think, between suicide and medical aid and dying. And that is, if you are seeking to end your life through suicide, you can stop. You just stop. If you're seeking to end your life through medical aid and dying, you're still gonna die because no one is eligible for medical aid and dying until they are in their final months of life. And then there's an emotional difference that I really have noticed that suicide is almost always surrounded by 
trauma and pain and grief and regret <coughs> and all of these st st very strong, often negative emotions. Medical aid and dying, the, the words you hear most from families and friends who remain are gratitude and peacefulness and gratefulness and relief and and it's you know they use words like it was a profound experience and they're thank you so much and so it's it's a much different tone of ending than with suicide I think. so that's um, it's not suicide any any other questions about that It's also not euthanasia, mercy killing. And the reason why it's not mercy killing is that means that somebody else has to do the actual administration of the fatal medicine. And as you saw in the definition, one of the rules of medical aid in dying in Vermont is it has to be self-administered so that you have the control and you can change your mind at any point and no one will stop you from doing that. Um, interestingly enough, I think Canada um, does allow other physicians to administer the medication to you, and they do it by IV. And so when a person in Canada seeks medical aid in dying, they are offered the choice, would you like to self-administer or would you like uh, to, you know, a physician uh, I, by IV? And 99% um, of the patients who use it choose, choose IV by a physician. So, um, you know, it's a safeguard for us so that, um, so that to prevent any kind of abuse, but I think thought that was sort of telling, yeah. So you have to be able to swallow. Yeah. Yes and no. The most common route of it of using this, this medication is orally. So it's drinking a small amount of fluid, two to three ounces, um, like, you know, like a large whiskey shot with um, the medicine in it. But if people are eligible, but they have a problem with, for example, swallowing, like some neurological problems, or maybe they have Crohn's disease, or some, kinds of, some kind of GI kind of obstruction or some kind of condition that might uh, affect absorption of the drug, you know, sometimes it's even constipation, then um, there are two alternate ways to use. The most, most common second choice is rectally. And it's sort of like inserting a small catheter into the rectum. And in that case, ooh, I have it. I have a visual aid. Ah. So in that case, <laughs> they must be able to suppress a syringe that looks sort of like this. It's a little bit bigger. It doesn't have a needle in it. But this would be, um, the medication would be in here, and this would be pushed right into the tube, go into the rectum. It's not used frequently, but it's, it's used Right, it's used and it's it's very effective. It's not it's not unusual. Um, the patient has to do that. Himself? The in the case if if we use this, there almost always has to be a nurse involved just to help. Yeah. Um, so then the the tube is inserted and the self administration part is that the patient has to be able to suppress okay. the syringe, but no swallowing and yeah. is involved. The syringe is actually a little bigger than this, but it looks like this. Um, so some of this is timing of doing it before you lose certain controls. It's tricky. It's tricky, especially for neuro people, and we'll, we'll get to that. So, um, so it's not euthanasia, uh, but it is euthanasia in Canada. Um, and I think they, they're not afraid to use that word. I think they use that word. Um, and the last thing um, 
medical aid in dying is not, is it's not for everyone. First of all, you have to be eligible. And second of all, no one should ever be forced or compelled or urged or threatened to use it in any shape or form. And that includes um, um, health care providers. So uh, the reasons for people choosing to use medical aid in dying or not using medical aid in dying are always personal. And, and they should be respected. And they are protected by the law. And we would protect them. But um, that includes doctors. And that includes nurses and, and social workers. And it's everyone's right to choose. So along that line, I would recommend checking with your doctor now. You, you don't want to find yourself in a position of looking for a new doctor when you're in the last six months of your life. So I recently have got a new primary care physician. And on my first visit, I said to her, so I'm fine, but you know, if I found myself in this position and I wanted to use medical aid in dying, would you be willing to help? And she said, yes. And I have even already talked to my colleague that we will be the second opinion for each other. So that made me like her. Yeah. When uh, a friend of mine did it, she needed to get a doctor initially to approve it, and then two weeks later, another doctor. Is that still the case? It's kind of, no. It's not re actually, it, there are two doctors involved. But you can think of them as the prescribing doctor, who is the main doctor. and you need a second opinion. In almost every case, and maybe your friend is an exception because there are exceptions, but almost every case, the, the prescribing doctor finds the second doctor. Because the only reason that second opinion has to happen, that second opinion doesn't have anything to do with the medical aid and dying part. It just has to confirm, yes, you are terminally ill. Yes, you um, are mentally competent. And yes, you can you're capable of self-administering. So, um, so was that a problem for your friend? Her, her primary was just didn't want her to die. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but it ended up approving, but she had to see another doctor. Oh, yeah, that's a common problem, yeah. So in Vermont, we don't have the option of, of uh, intravenous? Correct. You don't have the option of what? what intravenous, wow. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, no intravenous, but but rectally or through a gastric tube, as we do. Yeah. Um, you were talking about doctors. You were talking about doctors not wanting to perform the procedure. Um, so, is there a list of doctors available for people? There is not. That. Yeah. The question was, and let me just say, it is the most common question the Healthline gets is. Do you have a list of doctors who is willing to prescribe? And would you please send me that list so I can move to Vermont and use that? <laughs> um, so there's no list. And no doctors wanted to be put on a list because I think they were afraid of becoming the death doctor. And um, many physicians, I would, I don't, I'm, kind of want us to say most physicians would be willing to assess, assist their own patient's panel, but really unwilling to accept a new patient for the sole reason of ending their life. And you can really understand that, right? So um, when people call and say, I've talked to my doctor, and he won't talk to me about it. Um, what do I do? Can you help me find another doctor? Even though what I said before is true, I really respect a physician's right not to participate. But sometimes they just say no without thinking. And partly, it's I think it's because um, one of the things that doctors seem to be very afraid of is for anything that they say to be interpreted that they want to get rid of you. They're very careful not to let it on that they want to get rid of you. And, and so 
you know, very often they will never bring it up. If you want to talk about medical aid in dying and you have, you know, have a bad diagnosis, in many, maybe most cases, they're not going to talk about it until you do because they're not going to put themselves in a position of seeming like they're urging you on. And you, you can kind of understand that, right? And, and the other thing is, if they haven't looked into it, and you know, it hasn't been around that long, and, and it's not used that many times. So there's lots of doctors in Vermont who have no experience with it. And it's just not something you want to deal with. It sounds like another bureaucratic. It sounds like more forms. And honestly, I went to medical school to save lives. I really don't want to be in the business of ending lives, and so no. But sometimes if you ask twice and you convince them that you're serious and you're eligible and this is a legal right and you're my doctor and will you please help me and if you won't, will you please refer me to somebody who will? And typically in small communities, doctors know other doctors and that's your best route. We don't have a list. I think no one would talk to us if we had a list. But um, working through your own doctors to find somebody else if your own doctors won't help, I think is the best way to go. Most times people aren't seeing doctors, but nurse practitioners and such. So is it only doctors? That it's only doctors. It's medical doctors and doctors of osteopathy, DO. That's also right. Now, some states have allowed nurse practitioners and uh, physician assistants, but not Vermont. Any more? Yeah. Act 139 states um, that witnesses to the patient's written consent cannot be the patient's physician. What does that mean? I mean, the written consent part? Yes. Okay. Like a witness, it can't be the patient's physician. Yeah. So who can it? Oh, somebody walking by, you know, um, sometimes it's like um, somebody who works and so, I mean, it's just, a, it has to be an unrelated person so it doesn't seem like I am going, uh, the doctor doesn't want to be the person witnessing the, the decision, witnessing the signature if he's going or she's going to be the one ending life. It needs to be an, um, a neutral person who can verify that no one is forcing this patient to sign. You know, I, I, I can't, I don't know. Does, is there a legal person in the <laughs> team? Yeah. yeah. Um, I worked with the attorneys who okay. were in this. And it's also unbiased and does not benefit from the death. That's right, yeah. Someone who d does not benefit from, from this person ending their life. Um, okay, so it's not for everyone, <laughs> the physicians also, but sometimes they might need just one more nudge to, um, to make them agree. So let's go into what medical aid and dying is. Good job. Um, so uh, first, uh, some facts. Uh, medical aid in dying was made legal in Vermont by Act 39, as we've said, um, in 2013. It was the fourth state to um, allow medical aid in dying after Oregon, um, Washington, and Montana. Um, it's now legal in 10 states, in, in, plus Washington, D.C., and it's in the legislature for 13 more. And one of those that it's in the legislature is New Hampshire. And you may know that New Hampshire had its first hearing on the topic last week um, uh, in the Senate hearing. And by all reports, it went pretty well. There's some skepticism w whether it will be passed on the first year it is in legislature. That's kind of unusual, but, but it went well. So um, Vermont is really looking at it with fingers crossed because so many Vermonters get their care at Dartmouth. And that, you know, they're, 
there have been workarounds to try to make that work, but it's very complicated and messy, and it would help a lot of people who get care at Vermont if, um, if, they would, if New Hampshire would pass the law. Um, the median age of people who use medical aid in di did you have a question? Uh, the median age of people who use medical aid in dying in Vermont is the mid-70s. The female number of female users who use it is almost exactly the same as the number of male users. Since 2013, um, approximately, well, officially, 203 people have ended their life with MAID. That's the official number, but as I mentioned, the health department collects those numbers and they only report out every two years. So um, that's a little bit outdated and it's probably a, f a few more higher than that, but, but that's, a, that's about right. And in recent years, um, in the 10 years that medical aid in dying has been legal, there has been a gradual increase each year in numbers of usage which I think is appropriate as more people are become familiar with it and it becomes a little more acceptable. Uh, and that's, that's a nice learning curve, I think, to chose. Um, anyway, we're now seeing about 40, maybe 42 people uh, last year. So uh, it's um, growing. In those 10 years, not one reported incident of misuse or abuse. The biggest users, as we mentioned, is cancer. About 75% of the deaths with medical aid and dying are triggered by cancer, and some kind of neurological disorder is another 13, and then the remainder is a small hodgepodge of things like COPD and congestive heart failure. And Roughly 30% of the people who go through the process and fill the prescription do not use it. And that's perfectly okay. It's perfectly okay with everyone. It's only there if you need it. And many people choose medical aid in dying because, as a safety net, really, they're afraid of what happened. If, if my pain gets too much worse, I want an exit strategy. Or if I start, if this drags on too long, I'm not going to be able to take it. I want to be able to control. And, and many people just want to be able to control their ending. And honestly, that is OK with everyone. It, the, in fact, when the pharmacist delivers the meds to the patient, there is included a um, you know, stamped, self-addressed box or bag to return the meds if you don't use them. Because, you know, they're pretty powerful and no one wants them floating around. And so uh, you put them in the bag and send it back. Yeah, that's right. Um, so, any questions about, yeah? Yeah, that's, that's another reason. I mean, people ha die because they waited because they didn't need it, and then they die. And, and so there's no time limit. Once you have the medication, there's not a time limit on when you have to use it? There isn't. Um, the only kind of time limit is that um, physicians will urge you to kind of estimate when you think you would, when, you know, many people say, I'd like to try to make it till April and then do it, you know, like that. And if you can kind of, kind of narrow it down and you're not held to that date, but if that kind of allows everybody to get, you know, the pharmacist to mix the potion. And in Vermont, maybe you've heard in the news, there is only one pharmacy in Vermont that fills the prescription, and he likes to hand deliver it to the patient. And so he drives to any place in Vermont, and he hand delivers it to the patient. And at that point, it, the patient can use it or not use it. Or, um, but if you don't use it, please send it back. But it, it, it tries to keep the medication um, not sitting around.
It is amazingly nice. Yeah. Have you heard about or come across patients who want to hasten their end because they don't like being a burden, financial or otherwise? I've only heard, I have heard stories of that, that people say things like, um, you know, it's it, it, particularly men do not want to be a burden to their families. And so um, they know that the end is near and they don't want to, their children to see them suffer and they don't want to be a burden. Um, and so this is their choice. I think that burden argument is controversial. Many people feel that somehow our society has made them feel like they're a burden and that is really unfortunate. But um, that is a thing. Yeah. I would also think that given the appalling costs of the end of life, <laughs> if you know that you are going to die, and it's costing you know tens of thousands of dollars a day, and you're not comfortable. Yeah. It could be a generous thing, not to say you're a burden, but I don't want to cost my family yeah. and the system. I think that is the reality. Yeah, I think you have, would have a hard time convincing your physician that that's why you want to end your life, but um, <clears throat> but I think that is a real thing. I agree, I agree with that. Yeah. I'm tied in with that. I watched my sister-in-law go through um, a pre-miserable end-of-life experience. And it's not just the financial cost, it's the emotional cost on the family and the patient. Mm -hmm. It was a horrible, horrible way to go. It, this was not an option. Mm -hmm. I, I've heard people say, I, I don't want my children to see me suffer, and I want them to remember me this way. I think there's another movement uh, in the United States that's called something like a completed life. And it talks about um, how you find yourself in a certain circumstance and you are ready to die. And it's not directly related to medical aid and dying, but it, it seems to me that's what happens sometimes is people, they have a terminal diagnosis, they know the end is near, they've said everything they're gonna say to someone and now that things are complete and they are ready. And, um, and I think that brings peace. Um, the pharmacist in Vermont, you said it's only one. Smile and Steve's Hochberg, yeah. Middlebury? Yeah. Uh, Rutland. From Rutland, okay. I had a friend who, who uh, went to get medications for his friend. He had to drive, this was maybe eight years ago, it was Robert Berman's friend. And he had to drive to Middlebury, right. he said, because nobody around here could right. fill it. Yeah. So was that choice from the pharmacist, or is that a state? Mm, the, the actual medication needs to be filled in a compounding pharmacy. And all, I mean, I don't know for sure all, but most of the chain pharmacies around, you know, the Walgreens and all of that, are not compounding pharmacies because they're more difficult to set up and they're, and they're more expensive to run. And so there is, at this point, that is the only compounding pharmacy, Rutland pharmacy that is filling the prescription, um, he does have six sites, so that helps. And the other thing is that um, Steve Hochberg, who is the owner, is, um, is semi-retired. And he is very committed to this, um, to medical aid and dying, and wants to make sure it's done right. So he mixes it himself, and he hand delivers it to patients, and he gives them education on the spot, and he gives them their, his phone number so that if there's anything that comes up, and he makes, you know, we consider it, I mean, he's a, he's a godsend, I mean, it's a blessing, and he's a wonderful person, but, um, but we need a backup. And, um, and at this point, we have not found there, there's might be another compounding pharmacy in Vermont, in, um, in Burlington, and we're talking, we have some docs talking to them, and, um, 
but uh, apparently there are not many compounding pharmacies around. So, did you have a question? Uh, it, I've heard that it's very expensive to pay for it. And does insurance cover? Insurance does not cover. So, what the so the the um, prescription in the time that I've been volunteering, it, it changes regularly. It's evolving. There's you know it's a new enough process that they're still doing research, and they're changing the um, prescription. So every change makes it more reliable and more predictable. So I think it's changed three times since in the last few years since I've been. When I started, the the sequel, a sequel barbitol was the, um, and you had to open up 100 little capsules and dump it into the thing. Wow. That cost $3,700, wow. and that there was no insurance for that. Um, there, the, I'm going to talk about the process, and we'll get to this part. But it now costs seven hundred dollars, and um, and again, um, Medicare still won't pay for it. But uh, it's a much easier. There's no pills to open up and dump in. You may be covering this later, but you mentioned, um, excuse me, that the prescription itself has been evolving. Mm -hmm. Is this based on? knowledge of people who had attempted this and the drug has not worked. And attempted it and what? And the drug has oh, not worked. It always works. Mm -hmm. It always works. There's sometimes some variability and we'll talk about that, but if you can get it in, it always works. Tony, if you're in a hospital, I'm assuming this can't happen. Cannot happen. It has, you have to be at home or maybe at a nursing no. care facility, no? no? Almost always at home. So the law gives healthcare institutions the option of opting out of sponsoring, hosting this kind of activity. And um, every hospital has opted out. Um, and at the beginning, every nursing home has opted out. There is some crack in that because people live in nursing homes and that is their home. So, you know, if the alternative is going to a hotel to end your life, how, how kind is that? So um, at this point, um, most nursing homes still say no but a few of them have said yes and then make everybody sign non-disclosure agreements so that no one knows that they have actually facilitated a death there, <laughs> even though deaths happen in nursing homes all the time. Does the hospice center in Vermont, uh, does, do they allow it? They do, the hospice, the, the respite house in Vermont, they do not, although we are banging at them because they really should. Yeah. But. Um, <laughs> Um, assisted living is a question mark. Some assisted living uh, arrangements are uh, saying no, and others, uh, there's you know some interpretation of the law that says you aren't a healthcare institution, you are a home assisted living, and you should allow it. And there's some movement around that. And how would they know this is yeah. Pardon? How would, how would they know? Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah. Um, Wake Robin has really taken uh, the lead on this and has allowed um, medical aid and dying to happen at all levels of their institution. So that's a pretty good leader. What did someone do if they're in, say, Berlin Convalescent Center and they don't have a family member that says, come and be here, and they're just stuck? Yeah. yeah. So I. That situation does come up, and could you repeat the question? What happens if a person is in a nursing home and they don't have family or friends that they can lean on to help them at their house? You know, hospice has come to the rescue on this, mm -hmm. and um, and often can help find somebody who either has experience with medical aid in dying and wants to give back, or there's just, it's just the kindness of strangers, and it has, it has worked out. Once, um, after Rob Merman's play, Act 39, we got a rush of 
um, mail from people who say things like, my mother used it and I would like to, if somebody is coming and doesn't have a place, can, you know, uh, we would like to do that. Or, um, my mother wanted to use it and wasn't able to use it and I don't want that to happen to another family so we would like to give our, use our ski home, you know, it's our spare bedroom, it's, it's, it's various things but the kindness really poured in after that, um, after that play. Okay, the actual process, which we've talked about it a lot but we'll pull it together now. So there's sort of five steps in the process. First of all, there's three requests. Two of them are oral and one of them is written. And there are forms to, to you know, track those. Um, typically the physician provides the forms, but if, you're interest, but if you're interested, they are on the Department of Health website and you could, you could look them up. They are strangely simple. I mean, they're just one page and easy, so I'm not sure what that's about, but it's interesting. So two oral requests to your physician 15 days apart and a written request to your physician that is witnessed. Then there's the second physician opinion. Pardon? Yeah, it says, yes, I, I am here witnessing this person signing a form asking for it. And I can see that happen. It's sort of like, notary. Mm, it's like a notary, but unofficial notary. Yeah, not like your spouse or someone. Nope, somebody who is unrelated. Yeah. I, you know, I think there are a number of legal decisions that need to be witnessed by an impartial party. Yeah. And so I don't know the rules about that, but it's that same. Um, the second physician, as we said, his only job is to um, make sure that you're terminally ill, looks at your records, um, make sure you're mentally competent, talks to you, and um, it determines that you have the physical ability to, to self-administer. Yeah. Um, mentally competent. Um, I've even had the experience where if someone on some of these drugs that they're given when they have cancer mm -hmm. actually make them seem like they're not. Mm -hmm. They mm -hmm. talk sometimes mm -hmm. and, you know, about things that don't you know, make sense, but it's the medication itself. Yep. So that's a perfect example of why it's important. It, it's best to work on this with your own doctor because your own doctor would know what medications you were on and what effect they could be having on you and and make some arrangements for that there to be a you know a small medication holiday so that I think in generally speaking your physician is able to determine to understand when the drug is speaking and when you are speaking the, the bottom line is if the physician feels that you are mentally competent to make decisions regarding your health care, they're not going to ask you to divide you know, hard numbers. They just want that level of judgment in place. Okay, so after the medication, after the, did you have a question? Yes, this brings to mind if you know you're going to lose your mind, this can't help you, right? Pretty much right. Alzheimer's doesn't qualify. Again, Canada has made some strides in that area, some motions in that area, but uh, I think the two most painful calls we get are people who would like to end their life because of Alzheimer's or uh, ALS because they then um, lose the ability to self-administer before they're in the last stages of their medicine. And those are really heartbreaking. 
Um, and then the physician prescribes the medications. So the medications come in two pieces. There's an anti-nausea anti group, and then there's the actual um, fatal prescription. The um, anti-nausea is three pills, um, Reglan and Zofran, if you're interested. And um, you take those 30 minutes before you take the actual medication, and that will help prevent any regurgitation of the, the drug. So you take the anti-nausea pills, 30 minutes later, you take the um, other medication. So that medication, yeah? Um, you referenced Canada's making some progress. I'm sorry to go back. No, it's OK. It just occurred to me. Um, working with individuals with Alzheimer's disease or ALS. I'm sorry, working with? Working with patients with Alzheimer's disease yeah. or ALS. Can you tell us what the, the progress looks like? Or? You know, I, I don't. No, I know I can't do it a lot, but I, I know it's things like um, just because you lose your memory, that doesn't always mean you lose your judgment. So they're trying to parse that out a little. And you know that makes some sense to me, but it also seems like a really big task to do it fairly. But okay. um, some states even just uh, to be eligible for medical aid and dying need um, require a psychiatric visit. Vermont doesn't. And you know, if a physician is trying to decide whether you are mentally competent or not, they are urged to uh, consult with a psych psychiatrist to help confirm that. That doesn't seem to happen very often, but that is an option for physicians if they need it. Yeah. I was reading um, where Vermont is the only state in which physical visits are required for aid in dying. Is that still true? Physical visits? Yes. Oh, you mean face-to-face? Um, -face when to? Um, I don't think Vermont is the only state that is that true. I'm. I don't think that's true. That Oregon had that, and our almost everybody's law is built on the Oregon model, but. <coughs> It's partially true. So uh, yes, you do need to have a face-to-face -face meeting with your physician to make your first request and to make your second request. Since um, the, that, those laws were, bef that was before telemedicine. So telemedicine can be used at the doctor's discretion, you know, if he or she feels like he knows you already and can, you can do this. But you must be, the person must be, everybody must be in the state. You know, this was one of the things when Vermont opened their borders, people were calling from Texas and, you know, can, can I talk to a doctor on Zoom and ask them for this medicine? This law is only protects people and only allows this kind of death when every single step of it happens in Vermont. You can't take the drug and go to an island or on a mountaintop in another state and use it. You're only protected, or your family and friends who are around you are only protected if everything happens in, in Vermont. Are there, are there people who come to Vermont and have a limited amount of time they have to live here before they're eligible? So you probably know that in, in, you had to be a Vermonter in order to use this law up until last May. And last May, the, the legislature opened up the borders, which um, I think morally is the right thing to do, but boy, it really increased the number of calls to, I mean, and they come from all over the country and everybody wants to move to Vermont to end their life. Um, so, no, uh, there's no there's no limited time. I think the, the, the biggest obstacle for those patients is finding a doctor, as we talked before, you know, there are some doctors who are trying to help because the need is great, um, but, um, and the stories are heartbreaking, but it's, it's, um, it's hard. It's not, it's now legal to come to Vermont to end your life, 
but it's not easy. So it doesn't happen very often. I think since May, it's happened nine times. Tony? Yeah. Uh, you said nurse practitioners are not allowed to do this. Great. So, so many people have nurse practitioners who mm -hmm. so behoove us to get a medical doctor soon, right? Or at least talk to your nurse practitioner. I mean, say, you know, if I am in a position to do this, um, will you help me? You know, most nurse practitioners have pretty close relationships with at least some physicians, and they should, you know, work together on that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I assume the answer to this is no, but um, is there any provision for someone with an illness like ALS or dementia to make a plan in advance and say, if I get to the point where X, Y, or Z, then I want to have this option? Such a good question. No. There isn't. <laughs> but there's progress, and it's good progress being made to do that. So, you know, living wills or advanced directives have been around a long time. You can now find kind of prototypes of, uh, I think they often call them dementia um, add ons or something, Alzheimer's add ons. And they, they, you know, you can't use them for medical aid and dying, but you can use them to strengthen what your wishes are before you lose control of. Stop eating, stop drinking. That's right, stop that's right. Don't, don't give me anything. And it strengthens what you say while you still have wow. your mental capacity um, for when you don't. And I think where those seem to be useful, especially useful, is in maybe nursing homes who always have felt compelled to feed, you know, I don't want to eat, I'm ready to die, and, um, you know, force feed. And uh, with the right um, addition onto your, onto your um, advanced directive, those, those, you can strengthen that, you can strengthen that. So people are moving in that direction. I mean, it's important, but not yet. And I just wanted to, to mention, as someone who helped people with advanced directives, and as a former nursing home social worker, always try to get those things in writing and get it down there so at least they won't feed you forever. Because it's the, it's the uh, people that are making the money off the nursing home every day, you're, you're paying in so many dollars. So does anybody have any experience with those addendums that, you know, that you can add to your, yeah? Just, I made one out. How did it, did it's, 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 it's how did it? Registered with the, with the registry. And how did it differ from your regular advanced directive or living will? Yes. How did it differ? Uh, it, it was rather similar actually, but uh, it's stronger very specific to to the situation of um, a, a dementia or inability to in other words not mentally competent. Okay. We can't hear him. Yeah. Well I know Exit Network does have a form okay. that you can attach to your advanced Who directive. Does? Final Exit Network. Final Exit. I know the state of Vermont on the Health Department website also has one. Dartmouth has one. Compassion and Choices has one, and Final final Network. Final Exit. Final Exit, yeah. I have a lot of experience with executing and helping people execute advanced directives. You've got to be really sure that the person that you're directing is going to follow through. Because mm -hmm. yeah. you can write 5,000 pages and the person just isn't ready. It can foul up the whole thing. And so your medical proxy is important. Maybe, maybe the most important thing. I, I think I agree with that. Um, Okay, let's see. <laughs> we were talking about uh, the medication. It's 
a powder cocktail, okay? It comes in a bottle that looks like this. When it comes to you, there's about sort of a teaspoon, no, I'm sorry, tablespoon, maybe tablespoon and a half of powder in it. You add liquid, two to three ounces to here. You shake it vigorously, and then most people, I think it's a good idea, pour it out into a cup because then you can kind of see what you're dealing with and and what you're taking. Um, a couple of things. It tastes terrible. Oh. I mean, the, it's the most it's bitter no taste. Life. No, <laughs> <laughs> the the liquid that people tend to choose the most is apple juice because a little bit of sweetness sort of helps to cut the bitterness. I've also heard whiskey. I think that actually makes it stronger. Um, I've heard maple syrup. I don't know, even know what that does. But the one of the main um, advice pieces of advice is to maybe take something like a popsicle or a sherbet before you take it, just to kind of numb your mouth, then um, drink it down quickly, and then follow it up with a, a popsicle chaser again really fast. And, and you know, it's really two ounces. You can swig it down, and, and it's up. I, somebody had a hand. Um, so the powder cocktail is, is five drugs. Um, and they're pretty common drugs, um, each one in a massive overdose, massive overdose. So just as an example, one of the um, components is diazepam Valium, which is, you know, fairly common, right? And maybe a, a common dosage would be 5 milligrams to 10 milligrams. So the dosage of Valium in this prescription is 1,000 milligrams, 100 times a hefty dose. And every other piece of the, um, every, all of the medications are kind of like that. So uh, it's effective. Um, straw, use a straw. Um, sometimes that helps uh, if you use a straw use the big kind that you can get from Dunkin' Donuts because it's a little bit thick after you've shaken it up. Um, but that kind of puts the fluid a little bit farther back in your, in your mouth. And now this is the key part. You must ingest within two minutes. Two minutes to get two to three ounces down. Sleep happens in three to 10 minutes. So what you really don't want to happen is fall asleep before you finish drinking. So drink it within two minutes, and you can expect you need to be in the position, <laughs> your final resting place, when you take the medication, because then things happen fast. And then death almost always within one to two hours. What would happen if someone only drank one ounce? I don't think there, I don't know of one single case that has ever not died. But if, so I think the number is something like 80% of the people die within one hour and nine, and 90% die within two hours. So almost everybody will die within that one to two hours. If there's an outlier, and there are, they don't happen very often. It's almost one of two things. Either they didn't follow the protocol exactly, and so maybe are falling asleep before they get the last bit in. Um, or more commonly, there's something, some kind of absorption issue that we talked about before, so that maybe there's a Crohn's disease, some reason why they aren't absorbing. Um, pancreatic cancer also often has reasons to cause absorption and Crohn's disease and constipation and diarrhea and lots of things like that. So it's really important to be honest with your physician uh, and for the physician to be aware of what's happening so that accommodations can be made. But, um, you know, I think the normal, the people say is sometimes it lasts five hours if it if it lasts longer than that, call your doctor. But people die. They, they all die. 
Is it common for a physician who does not want to um, participate to refer patients on, or is it uncommon? I think it's common. If, if a physician does not feel comfortable prescribing, do, is it common for them to refer to a, a person? And yeah, I think it is common. Um, after watching the play Act 39, and yeah. I saw a video recently of a Connecticut woman who came up yeah. here to, to take advantage mm -hmm. of this, um, their deaths were so peaceful. Mm -hmm. It just was so beautiful to me. It, it, it appeared they did not suffer at all. I mean, emotionally, I couldn't testify that, to that, but is that? It's absolutely the most common way, the most common response. So once you have fallen asleep, once the patient has fallen asleep, they don't feel anything more, they don't, they aren't aware of anything more. So in the, there are, depending on the people, some like twitching, you know, um, in the rare event there's an occasional seizure, all of those things are terribly um, difficult for a, the people who are around them, but they don't bother the patient. The patient at that point, for all practical purposes, is gone. They just, their heart hasn't, hasn't stopped beating yet. So, um, though, I think one of the um, things that people talk about is when people are in the process of dying, one of the things that happens is an agonal breath, where all of a sudden it seems like everything is going and then they go <gasps> and everybody <laughs> and that's okay it's it doesn't mean what you were afraid it means it just means that it's one of their last breaths um that's it I, I think you answered this already but i've forgotten does a doctor or nurse need to be present does not we always recommend having a hospice pre present just because if anything can go wrong, that's the way to do it. Um, also, a hospice nurse can pronounce um, death by being right there. So even if the hospice nurse isn't present, we always would nice to be on call. Um, that is the patient's choice. It's not necessary. But I will tell you that there was a recent case where a person um, did not have family, was at, used her friend's house to die, um, forgot or didn't choose to get a, um, a do not resuscitate order or a colst. And that poor friend, when <laughs> she, when she, uh, she called EMS to come and pronounce and when they arrived, they felt like they were legally obligated to resuscitate. And so she explained what was happening and then, and, and basically threw herself on her friend's body. And, um, and so the EMT said, well, legally we're obligated. So they called um, the police. And the police came, and this was a small, um, Vermont community, and it was six o'clock in the morning, and um, they had not ever heard of medical aid and dying, so they called the detective who came and <laughs> who then called the um, medical examiner. So it was kind of a circus and really, really unfortunate, and just, you know, a coast form on the refrigerator would have. So, Tori. So that's the question is, if, if I invited somebody to be at my house yeah. to do this, yeah. what are the steps that I need to know so that, uh, I mean, I would never call 911, uh, but um, who do I call? Uh, you know, how, what is that process? That's why it's really nice to have hospice. And, you know, just on the case, whether they're there or not is not important. You can also call the physician and or people call us <laughs> and you know not usually well our questions are usually a little different like 
I still have some powder caught in my cap. How do I get rid of, you know, but, um, but as a host of something like this, um, I think it would be really helpful to make sure that this person has made arrangements for like a funeral home to come and pick up so that you aren't what, left with that. So the fact that they, they uh, die in your house, which is not their house, isn't considered other property, so the medical examiner doesn't have to come? Correct. Uh, 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 a uh, legal person has to pronounce that person dead, okay. but, um, that it could be but it can be hospice. Now, can you have home hospice and for your doctor have the, the assisted death? Uh, we see the question. Well, you have home hospice mm -hmm. because you, you have a diagnosis of six okay. months or less. But hospice itself does not really endorse this, correct? I'm, well, you, you can't have a hospice person there when you're doing it, or you can? You can. You absolutely can. So there's nothing in the law that prohibits hospice from being there. There's nothing in the law that prohibits hospice from helping prepare the medication shaking it, um, but most hospice agencies have policies around that and their restrictions, but because, because of Medicare and because the, there's their legitimate, their legitimate concerns, Medicare is specific about cannot do anything to assist a person's death or some kind of language like that. But um, most hospices um, find that they need to be there to um, counsel the patient and their fine, you know, there's work, it's a workaround. It's a workaround. And in some case, it's just that they can't charge for the time that they've spent mixing the medication if they mix the medication. And so different hospice agencies uh, handle that differently. And it's all about risk tolerance, how, how much they're willing. Everybody's like on a budget cliff. And so the thought of losing some financing because they were there. When, and so it's, it's a problem. And so right now, all of the hospices in Vermont are planning a, a get-together conversation and s to trade information about how each are handling it and how best practice can emerge because it's, it's new. And, and uh, so they, there's nothing in the law that prohibits them from being there. Sometimes their, their individual agency does prohibit that. This assumes the patient or the person is already enrolled in, in a given hospice. Yeah. The hospice needs to have a relationship with them, yeah. not just to come to pronounce. Oh, right, right. Yes, that needs to be another perfect reason why <laughs> it's a good idea to be enrolled in hospice, yeah. And do you know when the hospice get-together is going to be? No, it's it's in pro, it, the planning is in in the making. More later, yeah. A couple questions: Is there any movement in the U.S. to to try to make legislation to use the Canadian model, where a doctor can simply inject into the vein, because it's so much more comfortable for the patient, and it works really well in Canada. Lots of conversation. But um, I think the general feeling is that all of the restrictions that kind of provide barriers to making it easier to get medical aid and dying at any level are there because um, it was the only way the law could be passed. You know, the opponents are afraid of the slippery slope, right? And that once you let um, dying people control the end of their death, the next thing you know is the people will be getting rid of their mother-in-laws. You know, it's a slippery slope. 
Um, and so that has not happened so far. And so uh, I think as people, as it becomes a little bit more normalized and, and no, um, there's continued lack of abuse that people will become a little less afraid of it, but there's no official movements in that direction that I know of. Lots of conversation. Go ahead. The other point, um, the Kellogg Hubbard Library has a book um, by the Canadian doctor who was one of the pioneers. Oh, yes. yeah. It's called mm -hmm. This is Assisted Dying. This is Assisted Dying, and it's a woman author, right? Stephanie Green. Stephanie Green. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Kellogg Hubbard Library. This is not about uh, assisted dying, but uh, when you were talking about DNRs, I live in a small apartment. It's subsidized. I sometimes don't see anybody for days, uh, and I have a big DNR or thing right on my door. <laughs> in case I die in my sleep, I don't have any of the. I'm very close to the fire department. They will come right up there and start pumping me, and I don't want that to happen. So if you really care about that and you're ready to die, put a DNR order on your door. I know someone who also has a medication bracelet that it says it says that on. Or a tattoo. Yeah. <laughs> right here. Uh, yeah. I just saw something that negated the tattoos. They're no longer real. They're they're not considered Of course not. Anyway, is terminally ill still fine that's within the six months? Say the last part again, why people do Is terminally ill still defined as within six months? In this case, it is. But having said that, everybody knows how squishy six months yeah. is, right? I think probably everybody knows someone who has outlived their six months. Like three years. Yeah, okay. <laughs> like three years. Um, or didn't make it to six months. Uh, so that's at best an es estimate. It's another reason f to where it's the best idea to work, if, if you're seeking medical aid and dying, to do it with your own doctor. Because your own doctor is going to be more generous having known you, trust you, know what you've gone through, know what you've suffered, know how serious you are about this. I just feel like those doctors are a little bit more generous about when you become eligible than a physician who takes a new patient, doesn't know them, and certainly doesn't want to be put in a position of um, ending the life of someone who isn't ready for it. Tony, is this our last slide? Yeah, just one more. You can go to the last one, actually. Okay. Because, in the words of Atul Gawande, our goal, after all, is not a good death, but a good life to the very end. Wow. Last slide. <laughs> Yeah. Have, have more, let's do another question. Can we do another question? If people are fine with staying, yeah. Yeah. Or we can end it, you can just we'll do it separately. Oh. That's like, looks like something more. Okay. Yeah. This stupid did not take notes. <laughs> Everything that you just said written somewhere. <laughs> I think there, I think I'm being recorded. Yes. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, I sort of feel like the important stuff is in the brochure. You know, the process is in there. Call me. We can talk. <laughs>